I am very delighted to be here uh, to uh, participate in this uh, happy event. Uh, I thank the organizers um, for uh, giving me this opportunity to be uh, present in this um, center of the uh, world. Uh, <laughs> there was uh, maybe there is a center is not unique, maybe. Uh, so there were some uh, we debates, <laughs> but we, we met um, in uh, another center which you may call it a center of gravity, uh, which is, uh, I do not know which is more relevant, center, uh, geometric center or center of gravity. Um, okay, thank you. So I just want to say a few words about uh, Carlos and my um, long association with him. So we met uh, each other long back uh, in the corridors of uh, Paris 6. Um, at that time, so long back that uh, at that time I had a, a reasonable amount of hair and uh, now you know. Um, uh -huh. Natural processes. <laughs> so, um, uh, apparently he was aware of my uh, interest in homogenization and uh, uh, he introduced himself uh, in the corridor um, and then um, we started discussions and then immediately he, um, he um, posed the questions um, by Pranshar. And then uh, he already um, had done some work with uh, Aguirre and uh, today morning we, you had uh, a little bit of history of this uh, episode and that's how um, um, we started our collaboration and the rest is uh, history which you know. <coughs> um, so I have been visiting uh, Chile for a long time and uh, several times and uh, um, we had a lot of discussions. You uh, introduced to me to your uh, parents when they were alive and then uh, other members of the family who are not here today but they were very kind to me and they, I enjoyed their hospitality. And then uh, you visited me uh, several times in India. First time when you visited me, uh, um, you were uh, feeling sick uh, without uh, proper meat. Um, um, and then slowly uh, you changed. Now of course I see you are more uh, health conscious. Um, so that is the secret uh, about uh, you know, people were conjecturing about his age. He is very health conscious. And uh, Lola and uh, myself, uh, we used to mock at him uh, when <laughs> he insists on uh, eating uh, certain things in certain ways. He has always, um, you know, firm opinion and views, um, even if he is not entirely correct. So, like uh, his, the periodic structure here, um, you discuss with him one day and then uh, you think that you have convinced him but then the following day you think that uh, he has gone back to the old position and uh, <laughs> you, you, you see that uh, you have failed. And um, another thing which I wanted to say, though, so yesterday there were uh, some things about uh, Einstein. Uh, well, I see some uh, features. Einstein preferred uh, models which are simple but not simpler uh, depending on your objective. Well, I mean um, you always, uh, your approaches were simple for even for a complicated problem because you, you go into the, uh, the fundamentals of the problem and then look for the structure there. And I would add one more, <coughs> Dirac. Um, Apart from uh, Dirac insisted uh, on selecting a model, the mathematical uh, elegance, 
the uh, stories associated with the Dirac equation um, is there in the literature, one can read. So, he, his uh, main uh, selection criterion is uh, mathematical elegance and beauty. And uh, you also always looked for uh, the similar uh, features in your uh, problem, in your uh, proof. And uh, we have been associated, we have discussed quite a long about all these things. And another thing that we discussed our uh, uh, big uh, patron, if you like, Jacques Lyons. So, um, I just want to cite one uh, sentence from him and then uh, start with this. Um, so, when uh, the book uh, he wrote with Ben Susan Papanikolavu, so only the draft was ready and I was uh, his student in Iniria. So, he gave me the draft and then uh, asked me to read, uh, okay, in particular, uh, Catrium chapter, fourth chapter. <laughs> so, il y a deux mille problem, je cite uh, Jacques Lillians, il y a deux mille problem dont le premier est de le comprendre. Um, so, uh, there, there are uh, such a prophet, prophetic words, I would say, because at that time he uh, felt that uh, Papa Nicolau, the way he has written, the way he has formulated the problem, the way he presented various ideas, Jacques Lillian was not happy at all. And now you know that, uh, that the fourth chapter has uh, given rise to several uh, developments uh, later on. And uh, so we used to discuss all these, uh, recall all these things and we discussed and uh, I thank you for giving me the opportunity and your long association over the years. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me begin this uh, um, dispersion. So, as you see that um, I have several collaborators here. Some of them are present in the hall. And uh, the last one is uh, Loredana. Well, I mean, it's uh, her old uh, family name, now uh, it's a different family name, but the joint papers are up, have appeared with this name. So, this is the periodic medium, you have seen yesterday's movie, how uh, the <coughs> heterogeneities uh, disappear as epsilon goes to zero and then you have a homogenized medium. Okay, so, the, I am going to present uh, some uh, aspects which are uh, different from what um, other people uh, have done. And I am, my perspective is propagation of waves in uh, such a medium. So, in particular, um, that fourth chapter in BLP. Um, so, the first thing is that experimental observation. So, these are the names I picked up in the literature. Um, so, when uh, waves propagate, um, for uh, small times, there is no um, uh, dispersion. That means that um, propagation does not depend on the wavelength for some time. Okay? And then for large times, you see uh, uh, bifurcation, you see uh, different behavior of propagation of waves depending on the wavelength, so which is called the dispersion. Okay, so, here is the model. So, you have uh, the usual acoustic uh, wave equation with uh, this uh, A epsilon. So, you have uh, A epsilon is the usual div divergence form operator with uh, oscillating coefficients and you have uh, the same operator at uh, epsilon equal to 1 which is denoted by A and these are the usual ellipticity hypothesis. So, in order to uh, in order to have this property, um, it is reasonable to start with uh, this kind of um, um, model. And then, in order to have uh, the dispersion property uh, for large times, you must uh, analyze this as epsilon goes to 0 and then um, show dispersion. Okay. So, in other words, the model we are looking for is not just a homogenized medium, 
um, because the homogenized equation, the corresponding dispersion relation is uh, trivial. That is what I meant when I wrote uh, that sentence. Um, so, it is, uh, it is, it is not uh, uh, going to model uh, uh, dispersion. So, we are looking for a macro model which has a non-linear dispersion, non-trivial dispersion relation at the same time well posed even for small scales, even for all scales. Yeah. So, this is the model we start with and then this uh, is a, a kind of a assumption is made for simplicity because it contains the essential difficulties. So, we have f here, we have 0 there with a um, band limited uh, f. Okay. So, this is the typical uh, um, model in application um, which is called a two phase uh, model with a given proportion gamma alpha 0, alpha 1 are the phases. Okay. So, this is the usual homogenization problem which uh, you have seen yesterday in uh, Loredana's uh, uh, presentation. So, I do not go into the details, um, maybe if necessary I will come back for the notation. So, what is important is that um, you can homogenize the operator um, and then um, you have uh, the corresponding homogenized operator which is denoted by Q here and these are the homogenized coefficients. Okay. Now, in the case of 1D, some uh, simple things occur. So, in particular homogenized coefficient you can compute explicitly for the uh, two phase medium which is nothing but the harmonic mean of uh, alpha 0 and alpha 1 taken in the proportion 1 minus gamma and gamma. So, in particular you do not see any presence of microstructure here. Okay. So, here is the big theorem um, which is found in uh, many sources. So, in particular uh, Ben Susan Leon's Papanikolaou, Sanchez Palancia and also more recently comparatively um, the paper by uh, uh, Francois Mira, Frank, Frankfurt and uh, Brahim Utsman. Okay. So, this is the homogenization uh, theorem for wave equation. So, the amplitude and the momentum they converge uh, weakly to the solution um, u which is the which satisfies the acoustic equation in the homogenized equation homogenized operator homogenized medium okay so this is the basic result so you see the 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 dispersion relation corresponding to this operator is trivial because Q has a constant coefficient. Okay. So, in order to capture dispersion, we have to go beyond this. Beyond this. So, there are several ways, uh, several techniques. Uh, um, so, you have, um, you can go look for strong convergence in the energy norm. Homogenization theorem as such gives you only weak convergence. And there you have a notion of uh, characters. And uh, this works if you have parabolic problem, elliptic problem because they are dissipative and uh, it is not working if you have a conservative system like a wave equation. Even if you include the characters which are suitable for elliptic and parabolic problem, um, there is always some residue field uh, which is very oscillatory. And uh, this thing has been analyzed by Francois and Frankfurt um, in uh, favorable circumstances um, using H measure. Okay. Full uh, amplitude and its behavior um, is not is open. Only the intensity of the amplitude can be done in some favorable cases. If you have uh, completely oscillating coefficients, the problem is open. Okay. But we ask a different question. We do not ask for behavior of the all the waves. What we want to capture only the dispersion. So, the question is the following. Can you define your macro dispersion coefficient and the corresponding operator which captures the dispersion? So, there may be several complicated effects. 
we want to capture only then the order beyond homogenization that's all now um, so here is where the idea of uh, you know block waves which uh, of course uh, was introduced in this field by uh, Carlos Conca and uh, Aguirre okay this is very helpful because as you see that uh, there is a hierarchy of uh, decomposition which is possible in uh, block wave approach okay so this is um, so what are the block waves you have seen it in Loredana stock you have seen it in Gregoire stock and uh, you see it in mine and you will see again uh, in Carlos stock so if there is a uh, Carlos Conca there, there is going to be block wave so you cannot um, maybe a little bit overdose but uh, okay so here block waves are simply um, correspond to Fourier waves exponential Fourier waves in for homogenized medium and the counterpart in uh, block, uh, in periodic medium is precisely block wave okay now so they are the standing waves if you if you like in the periodic medium now how they look like so these are the homogen uh, in the homogeneous medium fourier waves uh, it is not exactly the same there is something so it is a perturbation but it is a multiplicative perturbation multiple this is the basic philosophy basic ansatz of behavior of periodic medium by flocke so say okay so we have not only uh, um, block waves but also the corresponding energies and the energies are denoted by lambda eta eta was the uh, the parameter in the dual torus which was introduced uh, today morning so i don't want to repeat all those things what is relevant for homogenization is m equal to 1 okay the first energy mode beyond that of course um, if you want to capture higher order uh, higher energy phenomena that would be necessary but uh, here we are going to look at only the lowest part of the energy okay so m equal to 1 so there are two indices that's the difference between um, the usual uh, um, homogeneous media where there is only eta which uh, physically signifies uh, the momentum parameter whereas here you have energy also so there are two parameters m and eta m uh, signifies the level energy level and eta corresponding uh, uh, momentum parameter okay what's important is that um, when uh, eta equal to zero so not only we look at the lowest energy but also small momentum so when you do that there are some nice things which happen in particular the lowest energy and the lowest uh, mode uh, black mode uh, they have some analytic property this is the fundamental thing this is what uh, you you have a hierarchy of complications added to the homogeneous medium and this is the the secret for, of uh, success of using uh, block modes okay so here is the analytic property and the corresponding taylor expansion of the energy and the block mode and uh, what happens is that uh, as mentioned uh, today morning the you recover the all the results of the uh, in the homogenized case so if you look at the hessian the double derivative of the energy it gives you the homogenized matrix and uh, the characters are obtained by uh, differentiating the corresponding uh, black mode so in other words um, you have a big universe block waves if you it's the infinitesimal approximation near eta equal to zero gives you uh, your uh, old objects and there are lot of things uh, inside the block world which is up to you to exploit so it's a very small information around eta equal to zero gives you all the classical result but uh, the big uh, uh, assumption here is the uh, medium is periodic if you destroy the periodicity by means of uh, you know interface or defects um, we, we have seen uh, a lot of complications okay so so way to stop with uh, looking at the second order derivative go further 
to capture dispersion. So exactly. So the new object here is uh, this fourth order. I have written several things, but then uh, the new object here is the fourth order derivative of the, the lower energy uh, lambda 1 eta at eta equal to 0. Okay. So, um, so using that can one produce an approximate solution capturing the dispersion. That is the, uh, the main objective. Okay. So, here is the attempt. So, first approximation. So, you decompose uh, your solution. This is the u epsilon of the first slide, uh, acoustic amplitude in terms of block modes, block modes with the certain coefficients which are uh, analogous to the usual Fourier coefficients in the homogeneous medium. Okay, as I said that uh, there is uh, superposition with respect to energy level and also with respect to momentum. Okay. Now, for homogenization, you have to take m equal to 1, I told you. So, all the higher energy modes you neglect. So, you have only one unknown here, which is this, the first uh, block coefficient. Now, um, since um, the operator has been uh, diagonalized, um, the equation, acoustic equation becomes a scalar equation like that. And then with the corresponding uh, um, corresponding uh, uh, things for the initial data. Now, this initial data will be the first block transform of f. Okay, f. So, this is the bus, first block transform at the epsilon scale of f, which is uh, an approximation to the usual Fourier transform. Okay. So, you have a simple ODE with the coefficient depending uh, on uh, epsilon. And there is a nice uh, analytic property near eta equal to 0 here. So, you have an expansion like that. And the expansion, the idea is to go beyond uh, the second order, which is the homogeneous part. So, you include the next order, which is possible. And then these are all error terms, which we will omit. And here there is some approximation that is also part of the homogenization. The first block transform converges to the usual Fourier transform. Okay, so, with that one can uh, suggest an approximation to this expression on the, the integral expression on the right hand side. So, which, which is given by this. So, it uh, looks complicated, but you see um, Fourier transform occurs and then homogenized coefficient q occurs and then this uh, 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 the fourth order uh, derivative d occurs. And if you uh, look at the equation satisfied by this uh, v epsilon. Um, it has uh, this uh, homogenized part plus this term with uh, some error, which is uh, what is expected. Okay. Now, the difficulty with this, so you seem to have solved the dispersion problem. You have, uh, um, this is a, a, a macro dispersion equation because it is a constant coefficient. This is also constant coefficient. There is no x involved. Okay. So, uh, it looks nice that uh, you have solved the problem, but no, this is uh, a surprising result which uh, we could prove uh, the help of uh, Rafael Oribe. This coefficient here, this is the highest order term by harmonic uh, type of term with this uh, tensor there, fourth order tensor, it has the wrong sign. It has the wrong sign. D is less than or equal to 0. And uh, this is true uh, universally. That means independent of the microstructure. Whatever be the microstructure, uh, this is true. And this is something um, which uh, came uh, as a, a thunderbolt. It is a, a big uh, shock for us. So, um, we have uh, unconditionally ill post prop. Always ill post. You, no way you can repair this. Okay. We will see whether we can repair it or not. So, we have an impost equation coming from a well post problem, but of course, you have an explicit solution V epsilon. I have given you the expression, but the thing is that unfortunately, <coughs> if you want to do any numerical approximation, you do not know it, uh, even though that expression is valid since uh, you have uh, ill postness 
you will the numerical approximation can, can generate small scales and uh, it is useless even though you have uh, uh, explicit expression it is useless. So, okay, uh, these are the slides to prove uh, D is negative, I do not go into the detail. So, uh, I, um, if you look at the literature um, where um, such uh, a natural approximation procedure gives rise to ill post equation from a well post one, the first uh, occurrence uh, in my opinion occurred when uh, Businesk uh, analyzed uh, water waves and then he was trying to suggest approximation. So, um, there are some recent uh, literature on that um, by Mojin and uh, his uh, co-authors. Now, they have remedied the situation, they have remedied the situation, um, they have in other words removed the difficulty of illposeness by playing around with a trick, um, they interchanged partial derivatives and time derivatives judicial, judiciously in order to get a well posed equation. Mojang calls it the business paradigm. Okay. Now, this procedure has been recently carried out in periodic structure, of course the original one for water waves. Um, so, for a periodic structure uh, the kind of equation acoustic equation this has been done in a more rigorous footing. So, again I picked up this names Askes and his collaborators in, uh, in Great Britain. So, they, um, um, they, they this interchange of uh, spatial and time derivatives is done uh, using Paddy approximation. So, you have a concrete uh, approximation rational approximation procedure. And then uh, uh, later, Agnes uh, Lamarche and uh, her collaborators in Germany, uh, they have done it in uh, full generality. This one is in particular cases. And uh, I just want to give you a um, couple of points on the approach of uh, Lamarche. So, there are two steps uh, in the approach. Um, one of them is, uh, so you have uh, this uh, bad uh, tensor with this uh, fourth order derivative. So, you split it uh, like this, you split it like this. Uh, in some sense uh, you uh, divide this by Q is positive, you divide by this operator and this is a quotient and this is a remainder and you can um, do it in such a way that uh, this E is uh, with a negative sign here it is positive and F is also positive. So, in other words, um, this is the fourth order term. So, this should be compared with that, this was negative, now it is positive. So, in other words, the ill postness has been removed, but it is not enough because that part is okay for, uh, but there is also, you know, we have to remove it at for all scales. So, this is the business idea. So, I said judiciously. So, you have to change uh, x derivatives into t derivatives. So, you do it uh, first to do this uh, decomposition and then here you see you uh, replace this by uh, uh, because the homogenized equation is satisfied. So, um, dou t square u equal to q dou x square. So, I can replace this combination by dou t. So, this is the idea. So, a, a, a kind of a curious uh, closure scheme to change the uh, behavior of these small scales. So, as a result, when you uh, do that, so the whole the equation, dispersion equation here, which is ill post, now for that I replace by this business uh, trick, you have this. Okay. Now, things are well post. So, W epsilon. Um, for any initial, this initial value problem is well posed because um, I told you that uh, this is this has a favorable sign. And not only that, it has non trivial uh, dispersion relation. Okay? So, this is the, uh, the main idea. 
Um, so, this uh, non-trivial dispersion relation is due to this um, um, business uh, trick. So, in um, W epsilon, this is the solution here, approximates the old V epsilon, which uh, already approximated U epsilon, um, which is the original equation, exact solution. At the same time, um, it changes the behavior of the short scale, so that the equation remains, uh, equation becomes well posed. Okay. Now, the next step, uh, so the important thing is that there is this presence of this uh, fourth order block tensor, which is here, but then uh, this is a complicated uh, algebraic computations here. It's, uh, it's uh, the, the, the exact information got lost. Now, in order to recuperate uh, this information, what one can do follow the procedure in the history, namely, um, since uh, the Businesk uh, periodic equation, we, I call this uh, Businesk equation for periodic structures. Um, since it is of second order, so in time, so we have uh, two families of waves propagating. So it is a bidirectional uh, water waves uh, type of equation. So you go back to the water wave literature. Um, there was a model by Businesk uh, for bidirectional water waves, and then Kurzweil de Vries reduced to more fundamental. Um, single wave propagation and that is first order. Okay? And uh, if you repeat that uh, uh, procedure, you get a third order equation here, not for the displacement, but for the strain, I said that, um, and it is a third order equation, linear, and uh, you get back uh, your fourth order block tensor D. So, in other words, if you look at uh, one dimensional propagation, uh, the more fundamental quantity is this uh, block uh, fourth order tensor. And uh, if you look at the bidirectional things, it is, um, so in other words, first of all this procedure is very complicated and uh, you do not see D directly there. Okay, so, this is the main thing. Um, so, I just want to end by recalling some of the things uh, which I have been saying um, or rather dreaming. So, if you want to, um, um, cut, if you want to uh, solve optimal design problem, you want to define, you want to design a suitable microstructure um, and manipulate the corresponding uh, um, dispersion coefficient namely um, the various things here. right? you have uh, E and uh, F, they are all macro objects, R, D, which is uh, here, uh, these are all uh, depending on the, uh, on the macro structure. So, the objective in uh, optimal design problem as you know is to uh, manipulate this micro structure and have uh, the required D, required uh, type of dispersion. Okay? So, this is the thing. Now, one obvious um, um, answer to this is to collect uh, all possible behavior. You vary the microstructure, you uh, collect all possible macro dispersion coefficient and uh, given any macro coefficient, you must know what, are, what is the underlying microstructure. So, this is a big catalog, okay? catalog, if you can form this catalog, then uh, everything is fine. Okay? Now, such a program is not new, of course, it has been carried out for the homogenized coefficient by several experts who are uh, sitting right here. Um, so, I reproduce their inequalities um, and uh, their uh, world famous figure. Okay? So, this is the um, all possible behavior including various uncertainties in the position of the micro geometry. And all possible things are contained in this uh, convex uh, uh, lens shaped region for Q with a certain uh, a constant uh, proportion gum. Okay. And uh, um, I just want to point out that there are some critical points here. So, these things, uh, the corresponding uh, um, underlying microstructure are laminates. So, the, here the corresponding thing is a hushing microstructure. Okay. So, these are the important microstructures which decide, uh, which determine this figure. 
So, our dream is to carry out a similar program for the fourth order tensor which is the fundamental quantity for um, one dimensional wave propagation with the dispersion in periodic medium. Okay. This is a dream, okay. but um, yesterday you have seen the, in Loredana's talk how this uh, quantity behaves when uh, d when the dimension equal to 1. This is the case which has been completely solved. Not only we have uh, the uh, extreme values, uh, negative values uh, up to 0 for d, so this is the expression which you have seen yesterday along with the graph, but uh, she forgot to mention one thing namely what is the underlying microstructure. Okay. So, we are interested in this negative value. So, what is the underlying structure which gives rise to uh, this uh, particular value? Okay. So, curiously it is a classical microstructure, it is not a relaxed microstructure. Usually in homogenization problem, you, the, the, the characteristic function chi becomes a theta, a theta which, is, uh, which takes values between 0 and 1. But um, among all possible microstructures for uh, Q, which is everything in one dimension, all the things uh, uh, give rise to the same uh, value for Q, that is what I remarked uh, earlier. This is the microstructure, um, people who cannot see, so it is a characteristic function. This is the microstructure which is picked up by D to realize this extreme negative value. This is a very curious phenomenon, okay. it is a very curious phenomenon. Okay, so, in other words, what we are saying is that you introduce more and more interfaces between the two phases alpha 0 and alpha 1, the value of d decree increases. So, um, here you start with one interface namely characteristic function of one interval, you keep on adding uh, more and more phases um, at the continuum infinite number of phases, infinite number of interfaces you reach d. Okay. So, uh, reach d equal to 0, 0 value. Um, so, at a minimum value we have just uh, one interface, at a maximum value we have uh, several uh, a continuum of interface. So, the main principle from 1D or main lesson is that uh, at the minimum value uh, just uh, you know we have to minimize the interface area and so we have uh, a sort of uh, isoperimetric problem. Okay. Now, um, so I said uh, that uh, Hashin uh, microstructure here, so what is the corresponding, so what is the microstructure chosen by D among the class of Hashin microstructure. So, in other words, this is the kind of program which is being carried out to analyze uh, D. So, the study of D is that given a family of optimal uh, microstructures for Q, what is the one which is chosen by D for its minimum value. So, um, this is answered only in 1D, in higher dimension of course, it is uh, uh, conjecture. So, here is one conjecture. So, yesterday you have seen, um, you have seen um, Loredana's talk about how this D behaves on laminates. So, here I show how it behaves on Hashin microstructure. Okay, I do not want to go into the details of uh, Ashin microstructure, this is for the people who know. Um, so, the one chosen by D is this particular uh, uh, Hashin microstructure which we call uh, Apollo Hashin microstructure. We want to minimize the interface, we want to minimize, we do not want to put uh, too many uh, core and uh, coating uh, inside. So, we want to have minimum number. So, this is the best way. So, you I am looking at, uh, so you have the entire R2 for instance and uh, filled with this kind of cubes and uh, I, I draw the, the core and coating like that, like that. So, with the half uh, side as radius, I draw like that and then I have four circles and I put uh, one big circle in the middle and then uh, I put a smaller circle in the middle and then I put uh, this. So, it uh, reminds you of classical construction of Apollonian circuits. So, this is the minimum parameter construction, minimum interface construction. So, this is the conjecture that and uh, um, maybe we are, uh, we, we are close to the solution, but uh, okay, this is still a conjecture. 
Now recently uh, we have been working on this problem. Um, we have simplified enormously the, the approach of uh, uh, Lamarck's and so on and so forth. Um, we have a very straightforward way uh, um, to obtain a macro dispersion behavior and the macro coefficient is very explicit. It's not like uh, in, the, in their paper, it's very explicit which uh, you, you will see the D appearing there very explicitly even in higher dimension. So that is the work in progress with um, Gregoire Aller and Mark Brian. I congratulate you for your uh, uh, this uh, 60th birthday. Thank you. So the last one, uh, only I can understand, it is uh, in Tamil. Yeah. So there, there was a very good idea to organize this conference in honor to Carlos. When I was invited by Gregoire Aller, I said immediately, yes, it's a very good idea to do it in, also in Spain, where you have a lot of links, familiar links also. <coughs> and this is a, a subject about inverse problems in medical imaging. It's a subject in which Carlos is also interested. Um, and I, I would say in, in Chile there's an increasing community of uh, scientists working on inverse problems. Uh, young researchers, uh, Jaime Ortega among them, uh, and in other universities, one of them is uh, Matthias Kurdurie, and a student of Gunther Ullmann, who was, uh, who was, who I remember Gunther Ullmann and Michael Vogelius contacted Carlos maybe in, in 2000, and, uh, 2000, asking for students to go to the United States taking some courses in inverse problems. And then I, I remember that Matthias was one of, the, of, of this, the first student uh, going there. And then uh, there was uh, some collaborations, uh, increasing collaboration with the United States uh, with Gunther and other, uh, Bo Michael Vogelius and other researchers. And it's a very interesting uh, subject since it's connected with control theory. It's, I don't know if, if, if it is connected with homogenization also, maybe, in the future. <laughs> so, uh, and it's also an, a very interdisciplinary subject in which you, you can collaborate with uh, people from other sciences in medicine, in geophysics, in engineering. So Carlos was, was working a lot with Jaime in uh, inverse problems uh, linked to the detection of bodies inside the fluid. This uh, rather different inverse problems is linked to the SPECT uh, medical imaging. So I will, I will explain what is SPECT and then just uh, put the problem. So the, the SPECT imaging technique is, uh, is rather simple. Uh, you have to take some radioactive <laughs> liquid <laughs> and then the, your tissue uh, begins to emit some gamma rays and thus uh, these gamma rays can be captured by an exterior cam camera, an exterior detector. Uh, both the the direction of, the, of this rays in red here and the, also the energy of this rays. So you count the photons going to the camera and then you, you, have, you, you can identify what, is, what they're called the ballistic photons, which are the photons that go from the source, which is here F, the radioactive source is F, directly to the camera. So, so the idea is, is just to identify, to determine this radioactive source from the ballistic photons. Huh? It's just that. So in order to have more information, this camera is turning, uh, turns around the patient. Okay, this, here the photo, you have this machine here which is turning, which is going around the, the patient and then taking, taking the measurements in all the di directions and all the positions. But there's some problem. 
<laughs> yes, thank you. Which is that, in general, uh, A is not known, huh? okay? Yes, all technology is not working. <laughs> And the, the, the main difficulty is that the attenuation of the medium is not known. The attenuation of the medium is just the attenuation of photons, the natural attenuation of photons inside the body. But, okay, uh, I will explain how they solve that, simply neg neglecting uh, the attenuation. <laughs> so, the idea is to... Uh, this is used, uh, I will show also transparency, is uh, used uh, since uh, 2000 also, year, as a technique, a very common technique in cancer treatment and also in order to measure the, some activity in the brain. I will explain some applications. But what is the mathematics of SPECT? So the mathematics of SPECT is a very well-known equation, which is called the radiative transfer equation. Here is simplified, okay? But basically, uh, this equation is the transport of photons in some direction, okay, which is the direction in which the camera is, attenuated by a factor A, which is unknown in general. <coughs> this is the radiative source inside the body. And this is the scattering kernel, the scattering term, which means the photons are okay, are not going uh, every, every time straight, but they can, they can change direction in general after some collision, okay? So in general, we have three so unknowns in the problem. It's a complicated problem. Uh, uh, what they do in SPECT? In SPECT, they suppose that the source is unknown, of course, but in order to have a, a solution, they neglect the scattering completely. So they consider that there are no scattering. And this term is zero. And for the attenuation, they try to obtain the attenuation from other techniques. For instance, uh, using uh, computed tomography. So they use computed tomography in order to have the attenuation, and then they use this attenuation in the model, okay, in order to recover F. Well, okay, if we suppose that attenuation is known and k is zero, there's a very simple solution of this equation. We can just integrate, if you want, the source, uh, multiply by an, uh, an exponential attenuation given by a. It's very easy to solve the, the, the equation. And the solution is the integral of the source along lines and attenuated by some factor, depending on this attenuation A. Uh, and this is finally, when you integrate along the body, here is, there's the detector. So the detector captures some, some, some integral of all this information along the line. And this is called the attenuated radon transform. Yeah, the radon transform is uh, just the case where A is zero, the classical radon transfer, without attenuation. And so if you have attenuation, you have the attenuated version. So the, the main problem in medical imaging for this technique is to invert this, this uh, uh, transform, so obtain, to obtain the source from these measurements. Uh, suppose that you have these measurements for every position S, you have the origin, you have a direction theta, and then you take the orthogonal of the direction theta, you move to in this direction, and also you have the angle. So you have two parameters, the position and the angle. And the Radon transform is a, is a function of these two variables. Okay? So it's a transformation from R2 to R2. And there's a, there's a known solution, which is called the the um, inverse, okay, for the attenuation transform or the filtered back projection algorithm for the attenuated transform. And it's given by, okay, by a procedure which is uh, a use uh, some other transforms in order to compute from the measurements the original source. Huh? 
And this was theoretical for, for, uh, for some years, but then uh, recently, or in 2001, uh, there was a, a numerical formula that was implemented in the scans, okay? in, the, in the real scans. So I will show you uh, an example, which I, I found uh, really interesting, is, is to study, in fact, uh, uh, treatment in, uh, in, uh, for Alzheimer's disease and for epileptic also seizures. And uh, what is the idea? The idea is that, in fact, uh, why, why not using other techniques? For instance, to use MRI, is magnetic resonance imaging, or use uh, computer tomography to see, okay, uh, what is inside the body. And the problem is that uh, for very, very low uh, flow, blood, blood, uh, blood flows, uh, you need this technique since it's very sensitive to low, flow, low, low blood flows. Okay? For instance, in this case, uh, we have here uh, different uh, brain activities for a patient uh, when he, the, the person is, uh, is uh, in a normal behavior and then during an epileptic seizure. Okay. And during an epileptic seizure, you can see that the distribution of blood inside the brain is different. Huh? So you have regions with lower, with lower uh, perfusion of blood and regions with higher perfusion of blood. So it is important to know which are the regions okay, which, are, uh, the, which are, we have problems during the epileptic attack or seizure. Okay? And here this is a movie. You can you can do this in 3D. Uh, where's the ah here? So you can scan the brain, okay, from the top, and see which is the the, the activity, the perfusion of blood activity into the brain with this technique, okay? And this is not possible with the other techniques since it's very, 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 it's a, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little, really little difference that can be captured with these methods. And this is used, uh, for instance, in the hospitals in Chile, etc. It's also important for cancer treatment when you are doing chemotherapy, you want to know what is the improvement after treatment, and then you also use this type of techniques to, to to follow the patient uh, between the different treatments. So it's, it's a very useful thing. Okay. But what about uh, reconstruct simultaneously the attenuation at the source? Why is it important for physicians to have the attenuation at the same time? Well, first of all, it's difficult sometimes to do a, a computer tomography before this, uh, this, uh, uh, the ideal is to have the information at the same time. Uh, you can have movement of, of uh, structures inside the body between one exam and the other exam, etc. So the idea is to, the main idea is to reference the source inside the body. The idea is the following. When you see the attenuation map, typically this is the distribution of organs inside the body. And then you can see where the source is exactly. So it's, uh, it's uh, between two hemispheres, it's, uh, where, where is it exactly? So to put, to, to reference the source, we need the attenuation at the same time. This is the idea, simultaneously. But there are no uniqueness of the inverse problem. You cannot obtain with these measurements uh, the attenuation and the source simultaneously. Okay? But there are a lot of people trying to do it numerically. Even if you don't have attenuation, they put a priori, a priori information in order to have uniqueness. Okay? But a, a physician of the Catholic University suggests us a, to use some extra information they have from the experiments, or from the measurements. In fact, they have some information uh, which is given by the scattered photons. Now, in fact, 
the red part are the ballistic photons going directly to the camera, but you have also the scattered photons we are going also to the camera. And you can identify the scattered photons by seeing the energy distribution of photons. In fact, the scattered photons have lower energy. So you can, you can see, okay, these are scattered photons and this is ballistic photons. So you can distinguish between both or among them. So the idea is to, to do that, but if you consider scattering, you have to consider the coefficient k, which is unknown. So you have to, to assume something about this new coefficient k. And we say, okay, we will suppose just that k and a are related by a very simple okay, relationship. So high spatial correlation among scattering here for simplicity is just a constant. Okay? We will see that this is not a, a non-physical assumption, in fact. Uh, it's very, re very near to, to reality in several cases. And the idea is to consider the scattering, the scattering as a superposition of first scattering, second scattering, third scattering, etc. And when you, when you decompose this, the total intensity in the scatterings, etc., you can, in fact, write another time. Okay, the spect, the relative transfer equation used for spect, where you have, okay, the ballistic photons here, given by the source, and then using the ballistic photons, you can use that as source for, to have the first scattering photons and then the second scattering photon, etc. Okay? And doing that, finally, we suppose that we have two measurements, in red and in blue. So in red, we have the ballistic photons given by the source directly, and in blue, we have the first scattering photons given by this term M, which is related to the ballistic photons. So you integrate the ballistic photons, and this is a new source to have the first scattering photons. And then, now you have two measurements, not just one, two measurements you can obtain from experiments. And, okay, so the, the natural conjecture is, do you have uniqueness now? And do you have a numerical, a numerical uh, procedure to compute the source and the attenuation simultaneously? So the inverse problem now is to recover, if you define the albedo operator, which is the, the operator uh, that relates, okay, the parameters to measurements if you have uniqueness, okay? So you want to invert this operator. <coughs> and the difficulties uh, with respect to expect, of course, of course we cannot, we cannot compute directly. Uh, we don't know A, so we cannot invert this operator in order to to compute F from the attenuated rather transform. So we have, but we have another equation. And now the problem is nonlinear in A. Uh, before it was linear. So the idea is to linearize. Uh, before suicide, we have to linearize. Uh. So, uh, and uh, in order to present the linearized problem, we need to introduce another tool, which is called the weighted Radon's transform, in which you replace the attenuation by a general weight, okay? But just the notation is I sub W, remember that. And we have some half regularity gain with this type of, of transform, as is the case for the attenuated rather transform, etc. These are pseudo so differential operators, okay? So the linearity in your problem, this, is, this part is uh, rather technical, but the idea is that uh, you take, okay, a reference attenuation, a reference source, and you do perturbations, delta A, delta F, and you compute the derivative of this nonlinear operator around this state, okay? And then you identify in, the, in this uh, derivative two operators, L and Q, and the idea is to invert these operators, L plus Q, this 
derivative. Look at it. So, uh, and why we, we, we divide into two? Since, uh, in general, if you suppose that, uh, if you suppose that A, okay, A, a check, not chapel, check. Huh? So, I have Axel check. Huh? <laughs> so, you take Axel check. <laughs> uh, the idea is that if A check is small, all this is small. Okay, Those, this is the small, the small part. And then, if you know, okay, that uh, in general, if you want to invert this operator, it's not so difficult since uh, the idea is in order to invert this operator, okay, uh, in order to, to have the values of delta A and delta F, if you equal to something, you can divide by M, okay, and then you know the value of delta A, and then you replace the value of delta A here, and you can have the value of delta F. So you have a procedure to invert if A is, A check is small. So, well, this was the idea. So the main idea is to prove that L is invertible and Q is small with respect to the norm of A check, okay? And this is exactly what we have to do. Uh, there are some technicalities, for instance, since you have to divide by this, this uh, information coming from the ballistic part of the solution, the integral of the ballistic part, you have to suppose that the source is not, is not, is noth is not nothing, is uh, strictly positive and not exactly zero. And if you have some photons, then you will have some, non uh, some lower bound for the integral of photons, etc. and you can divide by M, okay? Okay, there's some technical assumption, also regularity, enough regularity for A check and for F check, etc. And the idea is that uh, to prove that this operator so is invertible since Q is small, so the invertibility of L plus, plus Q is, follows from the invertibility of L for A check small enough, okay? And you can also show from this linearized uh, uniqueness, you can uh, prove the uniqueness for the nonlinear problem, but locally, as usually. Hmm? Okay, so uh, I will uh, skip the proof, but just to say uh, the, main, the main difficulty is to prove uh, some estimates in solvable fractional solvable spaces uh, for, for, for these uh, weighted radon uh, transforms, etc. But it's uh, just technical work. So I will show some numerical experiments. Okay? So this is a typical, the typical phantom, we call phantom, which I, I, when I, I started to, to do inverse problem, I, I say, okay, this is the lungs, this is the hair, no, nothing to do. This is, uh, in fact, uh, a phantom intended to, to, okay, to be a brain, in fact. So these are the hemispheres, <laughs> nothing to do with, with uh, this part. And this is the, a typical source here. So the idea is that you have some radiative sources inside the brain. And you want to recover the source and the attenuation simultaneously. And this is the typical measurements. Uh, this is uh, difficult to, to understand the beginning, but it's, uh, it's the angle, so it's the camera which is moving like this, and this is the position of the detector into the camera. Okay, so you have 2D, uh, 2D observations for the ballistic, so direct rays, and from the scattered rays. And you can have error or <coughs> Just uh, in, in practice, you have uh, some poison error in the measurements. That, that's measurements or that's scientific? This, these are measurements. Real measurements. No, 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 no. I, uh, we will see real measurements. This is just synthetic, synthetic for the moment. But, yeah. And we add some, some poison noise since you count photons. So it's not really. And this is a synthetic uh, example where you can see, uh, it's, it's strange, but the exact red is not seen here, but there's, there's the, the exact red 
a circle and moon here, but we, you can see, due to the, uh, the color, the exact red color is not shown, I, know, I don't know why, but this is the typical, uh, the typical iteration. So this is classical spect, you can recover the source, but not the attenuation. And this is the first iteration of an iterative method, okay? So when you iterate, you go closer and closer of the attenuation map here. So the idea is to superpose this reconstruction with this attenuation. And then you can localize where the source is with respect to the organs. <clears throat> we have a real, we have tried to, to do something with real data, data, so we started with that. This, is, this was from real data, so what is the problem? You put a cylinder, we have several structures in the different layers, okay, so you have some periodic structures and then some, some a little or a small objects, etc. And we compare the normal spect with uh, this uh, different spect and this is the attenuation we obtain. So we didn't know if, okay, we, we, the first thing we notice is that the error uh, in the, the new reconstruction is, is small, okay, but it's difficult to see. Uh, Exactly, so we constructed an experimental setting, okay, in order to, 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 do, to, to, to know exactly if it was working, it's okay? So we take some, some, some okay, plastic cylinder and we put inside some scattered, so a big scatterer, a medium scatterer and a big scatterer and a radioactive source. Okay, so the, rad the radioactive source is here. This is the big scatterer, the medium scatterer, and a pencil as a small scatter. Okay, and we put that in the machine and take measurements. Okay, so this, uh, these are the results. So, uh, just for the attenuation, the source is very easy to, to locate. Okay, you, you can recover the source easily. But the difficult thing is to recover the attenuation of the media at the same time. So this is for the attenuation. So when you go through the object, at the beginning there's nothing, then you are in this part of the object where just, it's just okay, plastic, and then you pass, in this direction you pass, and you see at the end the objects. Okay, this is the idea. And here you can see uh, nothing, then you see the cylinder, here, so this, this is the exact cylinder and this is the recovered cylinder. Then you see the, you begin to see the structures here. Here there's the hole where the source, the radioactive source is, okay? You can see that and the first, the big scatter. And then you can see the two scatters and if you have good view, <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's uh, just a very, a small point here, which is the, the pencil. Huh? And then, okay, uh, also this is exact, but you, you can see here the big scatter, the medium, but you can see the pencil. Huh? Here the medium scatter is not seen, but you can see a little bit. So it's okay. The method is okay. You can recover in practice from real measurements, you can recover something. So you know, there's a lot of things to do. In, in practice, we, we want to implement this method in real, in real machines, as Carlos did. <laughs> so I finish with this uh, photo, which is a presentation of uh, the portable echograph that they, they built with Carlos, with a colleague in the Department of Mathematical of uh, Electrical Engineering, Emmanuel Duarte. Okay, and this was uh, the demonstration of this equipment in the festival, of, the festival of engineering and sciences we had last October. Last or, October yes. yes, and this is the stand of the Center of Mathematical Modeling showing this this new technology. And so there's a patient here, <laughs> 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 and a real patient. 
and this is Carlos with the, with the machine, which consists uh, okay, in a portable echograph. Uh, this is the, the, I don't know which is the name, the transductor. And this is, uh, these are, I think, uh, glasses to see. If you don't have a, a screen, you can have a video game, video game. <laughs> from Sony, maybe. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Carlos. Okay, so we are about to finish. I, I wanted to make sure to thank everyone. Maybe I didn't do it enough uh, in the opening of, of the conference, but now it's time to do it because everything was quite successful. Uh, even, even dinner di yesterday, it seems that the menu was uh, at the level of what people expected uh, in Basque cuisine. Uh, I wanted then to, to thank especially Irancho Erespe, who is somewhere there, our executive uh, secretary that uh, took care of everything. Uh, this was a, really a, a Euskadi Chile workshop because you know, Irancho was the main organizer, but there were two persons, uh, Jaime and uh, Rodrigo, who is there, who really made uh, everything. So for me, it was, it was really simple to follow. And uh, we were very lucky because we have a lot of support from scientific committee. Greg in Paris was uh, the third partner, uh, also the organizing committee. But we also had uh, plenty of uh, sponsors that uh, as soon as we said we were planning to organize something in honor of Carlos, they offered immediately uh, financial support that was uh, significant and allowed us to do this in this uh, atmosphere, this this place. So the first uh, center I would like to mention is the Centro de Modelamiento Matemático in uh, Universidad de Chile, the Bas Center for Applied Mathematics here in Bilbao, the European Research Council that through the advanced grant uh, numeric waves uh, that we are running in our team also offered financial support, uh, the CONICIT, uh, I understand this is like the Chilean uh, say NSF, uh, the CNRS, the French uh, Research uh, Network, uh, ICEMAT, the Institute of uh, uh, Mathematics in, in Madrid. Uh, Rafa was here. I don't know whether he's, he's, still, uh, he's still around. Rafa, yes, yeah, so thank you, Rafa. Um, then we also have the support from uh, the Faculty of Engineering of the Universidad de Chile the one that was founded by Gorvea, as you mentioned the other day, the ESMAI, the French Society for Applied Mathematics, the RESME, the Royal Society of Mathematics uh, in Spain, uh, this uh, GDR, uh, Groupement de Recherche uh, E for European, European uh, Network of uh, Research in Control of PDs that was uh, launched uh, very efficiently by Fatia Labo several years ago and now is being run uh, in France by Karim Bochard. Uh, the ECOD, the Institute of, for Control and Decision of Paris Saclay. So this, as you know, uh, France is doing a, a great effort to, to build around Saclay, Saclay platform where, where in particular Polytechnique is. It's, it's a new uh, university, and, uh, and then ECOD is a new lab uh, oriented to control of PDEs or control in general that is uh, led by Yassine Chitour, and he was also very enthusiastic about supporting this initiative. The Ecole Polytechnique uh, by, that was represented here by, by Greg Aller. Uh, the Basque government, Eusko Harlaritza. Uh, the Chilean Academy of Sciences that was represented here at the highest level by Professor Asenjo, and the Laboratoire uh, M MAP MAP 5, c'est plus facile en français, uh, coordinated by Annie Raoul, who I think is here also, and she was also very supportive. Maybe, may I, maybe I'm forgetting some, some other supports we had, we certainly did, but these are uh, some of them, and I think it's a very good idea, uh, gives a very good idea of how brought the enthusiasm internationally was uh, for the organization of this workshop. Okay, so this is the first time I see this picture. So this is the picture we took uh, yesterday. You can uh, 
recognize uh, some people there, okay, so maybe easier in the first row that uh, up there, <laughs> but uh, let's hope that Photoshop can do something to, uh, to improve. Uh, and uh, I thought there was a, a last photo, but, uh, but this is it. So this is the poster. The poster was done in, uh, I find it particularly nice, it was, it was, it was done in, in the faculty in the, in the CMM. Uh, I don't know who was the designer of this. Christian Murillo. Huh? Christian Murillo. Christian Murillo. It was uh, very, very successfully done. And uh, well, thank you again. Among uh, all the honors I have received uh, these days, uh, there is this last one which consisted in asking me to give the, the conference closing. I will speak uh, about uh, some mathematics connected with physics and uh, connected with science, trying uh, not to go into any details, technical details of uh, what we, I have done in mathematics because uh, I have all my family here and I don't want to be in travels with them. <laughs> uh, and uh, since uh, I have been asked to give this conference, I allowed myself to divide it, it into two parts. In the first part, I will go through some details of my career as mathematician and I will go into more mathematical presentations of uh, things in the second part of my presentation. So I will start with uh, some biographical uh, outline of my career and to do that I have chosen to, to link my career with my journeys. So I have choose two or three journeys that have marked my personal life uh, and uh, my career as a mathematician. So the first trip was in, uh, first important trip was in 1979. It was my trip to Paris. I went there to, to earn my PhD. I was supposed to be there for maximum two or three years, but uh, I only came back almost 10 years after, eight years and a half. So I stayed in Paris a very long time. It was uh, maybe the most important trip and the most important experience I have had in my life. The second trip that uh, was extremely important in my life was a trip I did in 1983. I was living in Paris at that time, and I visited uh, Madrid, University Complutense. It was some kind of a doorway to the Hispanic world and the flourishing school of Spanish School of Applied Mathematics in, in Spain. Uh, and the third trip uh, was already mentioned this morning by Bunny. It was between 1994 and 1995. I went for uh, three months as a visiting researcher to Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mathematics at Bangalore because the, the main warehouse of Tata 
it is in bomb pi, and this one uh, control L. It is better. <laughs> control L. Oh, okay. Later, no? <laughs> we will do that later. At that time, the Tata Institute uh, had a very charming building inside the wonderful India Institute of Science campus. The building shared, at that time, two areas. One area where uh, we could find the, the institute itself, and a second area where there were uh, visiting the rooms for the visiting researchers. So during my state, I was living in this uh, institute and working all the time, 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Uh, it was a, a monastic experience <laughs> working <laughs> all the day during, all the, all the time I was at work, <laughs> even when I was sleeping. It was <laughs> a very productive stay, and uh, I will never forget it. <laughs> I have never repeat that. that. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> journeys open the mind. And if you are in a good mood, mood in the correct mood and ready to learn, there is a whole world which reveals itself to you. And this is what uh, happens to me when I arrived to Paris with the French School of Applied Mathematics. It was uh, Philbert Mignon who would incorporate me to Paris 6 and to the laboratory of numerical analysis and partial differential equations. Uh, this uh, laboratory was founded by Jacques Louis Lyons 10 years ago. I was arrived in October 79, uh, 1979, and uh, the laboratory was founded. Uh, 10 years ago in 1969. So here is Jacques Louis Lyons, who was the founder of the laboratory. At that time, one was uh, the classical path for any student uh, in Paris was to follow the trajectory DEA, the DA, test the troisième cycle, and test the DA. I enjoyed, I greatly enjoyed all this path under the guidance of eminent French professors, French researchers, and engineers. I had the privilege to be guided by multidisciplinary people, people coming from uh, mathematics, fundament more fundamental mathematics, from uh, other sciences. I will show you which are the people have, who have been more influential in my career, and people coming from uh, classical engineers. Uh, the first of my advisors uh, was Jean-Pierre Poel. I put here uh, some of the guides he, he wrote at that time. So I kept them, yes. So you can see here 
that uh, he, won, he was the first to introduce me to homogenization problems and this memory effect, okay, which has played a fundamental role all over my contribution in mathematics. But uh, I was also, okay, I will use the word advisor in a very large sense, okay? Maybe uh, we can replace the, way, the word advisor by influential people, okay? And uh, the other one at the same level is Professor Francois Mira. <laughs> he is here. He gave a very beautiful presentation this morning. And uh, he introduced me to plenty of different subjects. And uh, here is his uh, handwriting, which is uh, typical. I recognize him much more by his right hand, by the hand right, than from the pictures. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, he introduced me to this uh, side stock problem, which is linked, of course, with homogenization, but also to these non-classical boundary conditions linked with uh, Navier-Stokes equations. Okay. Uh, in particular, with this flux in post-boundary conditions, which allows me to introduce this uh, bilinear form in which you don't have the classical gradient-gradient uh, operator, but you have rotational-rotational. And this uh, bilinear form has a kernel which is not equal to zero, it is not uh, elliptic, and uh, there is some interesting mathematics to be done. So, well, you know uh, both of them, and you can easily imagine uh, the great privilege I had to be connected with uh, Francois and Jean-Pierre, and to receive uh, their warm friendship at the same time as its scientific guidance. But uh, they not only introduced me to mathematics, but also to this big family around Professor Lyons. And uh, <coughs> All what it is, all what at that time uh, was around him. He was the chairman of a seminar, a, a one-week seminar at uh, Collège de France. He had plenty of uh, PhD students with whom uh, I could discuss, uh, and former students that were also that uh, were also enormously uh, influential in my career and three of them are first uh, fundamental mathematicians in France Luc Tartar uh, here he was explaining to me that uh, if you want to pass to the limit in Navier-Stokes equations, uh, you will not have enough a priori estimates, and you need to use this uh, compensated compactness of Nura Tartar. Uh, from the mechanical side, there is a Spanish uh, engineers, uh, originally Enrique Sanchez Palencia, today he has changed to Evarist Sanchez Palencia. He also taught me several ideas 
technical ideas on how to uh, tackle important questions in mechanics linked with mathematics. Uh, in particular, the matching asymptotic expansions. It was Sanchez, uh, Palencia, who gave me this idea in order to treat this side Stokes problem, who was uh, suggested by Francois very early in my career. But uh, another interaction which was extremely fruitful with, was with Jacques Planchard. Uh, this morning, Grégoire Aller, he was speaking about this kind of mathematical models in order to understand vibrations of tube, tubes inside the condensers at EDF. And here, there is this celebrate boundary non-local boundary conditions uh, in which there is the integral of the force around on the boundary of the tube. And uh, when you try to homogenize this kind of model, as was said by Gregoire this morning, classical homogenization doesn't work. And you need to, to do something else. And this was the starting point for this uh, block decomposition. OK. Uh, but uh, <coughs> those were really uh, maybe the, my very best uh, years in my career. Those were, we can say, golden years in my, form, in my training. But uh, of course, nothing of that would be what it is if uh, I didn't meet Lola. Uh, in 1982, no? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and uh, we get married in uh, December 30, 1984, so two years after. And uh, five years later, uh, Maite was born. Uh, this was a special day because uh, not only Maite was born, but uh, some of you were in Chile at that moment because we were closing the second uh, Franco-Chilean Congress on Applied Mathematics. In particular, Jean-Pierre was there, Grégoire was there, and uh, <coughs> maybe Eric, no, no, Eric, uh, Fulbert was, was there, yes. Fulbert was there. Sylvie Masgalic. Okay. Now I will go through a little bit of mathematics uh, without any technicality. And the starting point is this uh, complex exponential. This is maybe uh, the most seminal idea that mathematicians have had all over their, li their, their life. Uh, and this idea was concretized by Leonard Euler. In his book, Elements of Algebra, I, Euler introduced this notation. I equals square root of minus one. This is something that uh, make a big difference between mathematicians and uh, any other researcher uh, that they do not understand very well what do that means. 
This is something that lives in mathematical uh, minds, but not in other. It is only in the in mathematicians that this number exists. Okay, this is some kind of abstraction that. Uh, if you are not a mathematician, it's very difficult to do it, okay? And uh, <coughs> in a second book, in his the book Introduction to Analysis of the Infinite, he was able to understand how complex exponential can be expressed by trigonometric functions, and he proved the theorem. He proved the theorem that says that the exponential, the complex exponential e to the power i theta is equal to cosinus theta plus i sinus theta. And here he was able to connect two mathematical worlds. Greek trigonometry and mathematical, complex mathematical analysis. Okay? If you, instead of e to the power i theta, you name that phi, as the complex variable phi, you touch two big words, in two big dots in mathematics, which is complex variable and a plane waves because cosinus theta and sinus theta are the classical plane waves. So this is the starting point of mathematical physics. Plane waves on the right-hand side of the, of the equality and complex mathematical analysis on the left-hand side of this equality. So this was a miraculous connection. And uh, today, one can ask this question. Is there in physics, or in nature, maybe, something that is not a way propagating somewhere? Uh, maybe the, if you want to say that the answer is yes, so there are things that are not waves propagating somewhere. The only thing I can imagine is gravity. And why I can imagine gravity as not a wave propagating somewhere? Because we don't know which is the nature of gravity. Uh, it, it is still a, an open question. Physicists, they don't know what is gravity or which is the nature of gravity. So maybe gravity is not a way propagating somewhere. But uh, <coughs> so thanks to this identity, we can link mathematics with physics. And uh, for people which are not mathematicians, uh, let me say that if you take theta equal to pi, you get this celebrate formula, e to the power i pi plus one equals zero, which is maybe the most beautiful formula we can find uh, anywhere. Why is this beautiful for mathematicians, at least? Because in this formula, we have all our main pet symbols. There is E, there is pi, there is i, there is 1, there is 0, there is plus, and there is equal. <laughs> so there is 
mathematics is concentrated there. <laughs> okay. So this is the first uh, role played by this complex exponential. And the second one is in the other sense. It is here, Fourier transform. It has been mentioned several times in the last, uh, in the last uh, lectures. Uh, Fourier transform, it is named for Joseph Fourier, which it is maybe the main actor of something that every mathematician tried to do, which is to mathemat mathematize the world, the real world. Uh, in his <coughs> celebrated uh, book, Théorie analytique de la chaleur, he wrote in Latin this sentence, which in English can be, can be translated as numbers govern the fire, saying that numbers govern the nature or governs nature. Uh, OK, this is, uh, in some way, he was uh, restating what was already said by Galileo. Galileo, he was convinced that in order to understand nature, you need first to understand mathematics, the symbols behind nature. OK, uh, it's not Fourier who got this formula, but in the case of periodic functions, Fourier was able to obtain a formula which is similar to this one, but which is simpler. OK? Uh, in this formula, you use all the frequencies, in fact or all the plane waves, all the uh, complex exponential, d'accord? Okay? And if U is periodic, this uh, Fourier transform, or this integral, becomes just a sum of a discrete number of frequencies. And this is the celebrate Fourier series coefficient expansion of u, in which uh, what you do is to decompose any function u in an elementary oscillations or the so-called plane waves, which is this uh, complex exponential. Uh, inversely, one can recover the Fourier transform starting from the Fourier series of the function u truncated between minus tau and tau, and next letting tau go to infinity. So there is some kind of equivalence between the general case uh, in which uh, u is not periodic and the case in which u is periodic. Okay? So periodic periodicity is very close to non-periodicity, playing with the length of the period. <coughs> Let me say that Fourier analysis has many applications. Uh, I am short saying that it has many applications. Maybe this is the most successful mathematical idea that has been used to explain physical phenomena, and not only physical phenomena, but also in engineering. Uh, which is the, the main virtue of Fourier analysis? It connects two other big universes the universe of in which one study 
natural phenomena and its mathematical modeling and also its method of resolution. So here uh, you can connect via or via uh, Fourier transform at least three big dots. Natural phenomena, mathematical modeling, and method of resolution. Now, <coughs> when you look at Fourier transform, in the way we are going to do it in the next slide, you will see that Fourier analysis, it is behind the Fourier analysis, it is implicitly the fact that waves are propagating in a homogeneous media. Okay? And the question was how to this Fourier analysis would be generalized to the case of a general heterogeneous media. We don't have a complete answer to that, but at least in the periodic case, with a period uh, arbitrary, we can, we can start saying how to uh, generalize this approach. Uh, so <clears throat> to do that, this was done uh, in different presentation before me. It was done by Loredana, next by, by Vani, and also by Greg. And the idea is to start considering wave equation in the full space, look for solution in by separation of variables, and to obtain the spectral resolution of minus Laplacian in the full space. Plane waves, so this complex exponential, can be regarded as generalized eigenfunctions with eigenvalue lambda equal to uh, square of the frequency. Okay? Uh, minus Laplacian has a continuous spectrum, which is uh, zero plus infinity. The plane wave is not a classical eigenfunction because it is not in L2, but it satisfies this uh, spectral equation, minus Laplacian of the plane wave, it is, is equal to absolute value of psi squared times uh, the plane wave. But these plane waves, they expand some kind of base for, fun for L2 functions, or so functions with a finite energy, in the sense of Fourier inversion. Uh, any function u can be written as a linear combination, let's say, of plane waves, where the coefficients are given by the Fourier transform of the function u, okay? And uh, which is, uh, it was uh, Grégoire this morning who said that using these plane waves, one can find the spectral resolution of the operator uh, minus Laplacian using truncations of the Fourier transforms. So the family of projections that produce the spectral resolution of minus Laplacian, it is given by uh, this formula which is here, okay? And uh, the question now is how we can extend or generalize this uh, picture to the case of a non-homogeneous media, medium. And the answer was, is quite simple. 
and it uses these block waves. So we consider now a periodic heterogeneous medium, which is represented now not by minus Laplacian, but by a, a more general differential operator with periodic coefficients, AKL of x. And each of these uh, coefficient is assumed to be periodic. And, well, which is the question we can ask is to know which are going to be the functions that play the, an analogous role as plane waves played in the case of an homogeneous medium. And this generalized eigenfunction are these block waves, which are named for the Swiss uh, physicist Felix Bloch, who, was, uh, who introduced this kind of functions in a, in a paper of uh, 1928. He was studying the propagation of waves in uh, electrons. The propagation of electrons in a, in a, in a periodic structure and they are solution then of an eigenvalue problem which is similar to the one satisfied by plane waves. Uh, today, these plane waves, they have uh, plenty of applications in physics, but not only in physics, but only also, as was mentioned by Grégoire this morning, in fluid solid interactions in order to understand vibrations of tube bundles in nuclear condensers. Uh, <coughs> if we add uh, these Floquet ansatz, which means that we are looking for the wave equation solutions in the form of this ansatz, which is also some kind of uh, separation of variables, but it is not exactly a separation of variables because both functions depend on both variables. So it is not really a separation, it is just a multiplicative uh, ansatz. The spectral equation for A is transformed into a more simple uh, boundary condition for the eigenfunction, but a more complicated operator, which we call it uh, the shift operator. Okay, I, would, I don't want to, to go into the details of the applications that these uh, ideas uh, have had in the, in the past. I would just say that we have applied this uh, de block decomposition in order to understand uh, homogenization problems. And uh, <coughs> just two or three things about homogenization. Let us say that homogenization is a central question in physics. It has been studied during more than 100 years. And uh, the first result in homogenization that I know are this uh, famous Clausius Maxwell Mosotti formula, who was uh, were derived in the case of conductivity. And a mathematician uh, appears in this picture a little later with the works by De Giorgi and Spagnol. And uh, this block wave decomposition uh, has result in uh, several applications, which are here, uh, most of them to understand uh, physical problems and physical issues. Uh, Grégoire Allaire and Vani and Loredana, they explained some of them uh, in their conferences. 
instead of going into any of the details of the applications uh, that this uh, approach has been able to to produce re results, I would like just to appeal of, to memorize, to just to remember two dialogues we have. One of them uh, was uh, recalled this morning by Bani. We had with Jacques Rillions concerning uh, what we were developing at that time. Uh, these two dialogues are the following one. Uh, this is the, the dialogue that uh, Bunny remember us this morning. He approaches Jacques Lyons uh, to comment on chapter four of his uh, book, Benson Saint Lyons, Papa Nicolau. So he said him, uh, Il est très joli le chapitre 4 de BLP. <laughs> and Jacques Lillian said to him, Le quatrième chapitre rédigé, a été rédigé par Georges Papa Nicolau. Personne ne le comprend tout entier. <laughs> and Bani, oui, vous n'avez pas tort, c'est dur. <laughs> and Jacques Lillian answered, Il y a 2000 problèmes. He, ouvert dans le chapitre 4, dont le premier est de comprendre. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the second one, it was the following. I approached the Jacques Lillions to comment on a Parseval's like type inequality that we had used with Greg. And uh, I said to him, uh, grâce au son de bloc, Avec Allaire, on a pu donner réponse à un problème industriel posé par Planchard à EDF. Jacques Lillian's réponse, oui, 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 je sais, votre papier est bien écrit. <laughs> Sinon, à propos des sons de bloc, il y a une note d'Israël Gelfand des années 50 où se trouve une identité de Parseval généralisée. Alors moi je lui dis, d'accord, je vais regarder. And here you can see the photocopy of Gelfand's paper, okay? And uh, somewhere he was right. There is some kind of Parseval identity inside, which is very similar to Fourier, to Bessel uh, identity, okay? And then after that, he told me something that I have never forgotten. He said to me, prenez les sons de bloc, l'homogénéisation et l'identité de Gelfand et mettez tout cela dans la même farine. <laughs> I will never forget that. <laughs> so, the result of this recipe it is well known today. <laughs> okay, I will finish with a, a joke concerning applied mathematics and applications of, of more pure fields into less pure fields. So sociology is just applied psychology. Psychology is just applied biology. Biology is just applied chemistry, which is just applied physics. It is nice to be on top. This is what a physicist would also say. And what about mathematicians? <laughs> oh, hey, I didn't see you guys all day way over there. <coughs> uh, okay. Thank you for everything. Uh, by years of warm friendship, for the joy of collaborative work, for the mathematics we have understood together. My warmest thanks to all of the speakers, to both the scientific and organizing committees, to Magali, 
and it answered. Thank you very much. Most of you are, are going back, and uh, we wish you a, a safe trip. Uh, these are important days, uh, almost uh, Christmas time. Some of you have to, to do a long trip to go back to, to your, your duties, yeah? your regular life uh, in Chile, which is how many kilometers, like 7,000? Uh, many of you are coming from closer, but uh, in view of the weather conditions, the wind, uh, well, it can be funny also to get to <laughs> places like Paris. Or, so. Okay, so I, I thank you very much for attending the conference. I, uh, I should say also that in the organization of this conference, we always enjoyed of the uh, how you say no, complicity, complicity of uh, Maite and Lola that were giving us uh, confidential information that was very useful to to retrieve uh, the career and the life uh, of Carlos. Uh, in case some of you are staying around for a few days or you have some time to travel around, well, this is a map that will uh, help you, you know, uh, finding your path. Okay. Thank you again. Show you one picture. Of how this began? This began during a. Uh, that's uh, in Chicago. One day we are we are talking with Carlos, and we decided to organize this uh, nice conference. Fortunately, Enrique has a visit has a visit to Santiago. You spend around one month in Santiago, and this began to organize. Uh, my laptop is starting, always it's more slow. But I want to say, uh, firstly, Santo Enrique, Santo Iranzo, San, San everybody to be here. Uh, thanks to Carlos also for, for the friendship from several years. I know you around 20 years ago. OK, and, and thank you all from, from the Chilean side. I'm not sure that I can see you show the picture. <laughs> But uh, I'm going to say that this began in a small restaurant in Bella Vista, Vista Tris, a Mexican restaurant, Como Agua para Chocolate. And, uh, well, no, I, I can't see, sorry. My battery is down. Okay, thanks, thanks to all. Okay.